the Foreign Correspondents Club. Um, heavy downpour, so people will probably keep rolling in for a bit. Uh, and there's also been a, a plane crash in Burma, which is um, taking up a lot of people's attention at the moment. Um, looking forward, uh, on Monday we have a documentary, um, The Hunting Ground. It's won two Emmys, and that's part of our uh, American series, which is why we've got the American Embassy all over our bulletin at the moment. Quite astonishing. Um, next week we'll be having a look at the coup dividend. It's going to be a program on the economy three years down the line, what's changed, how have things uh, improved, uh, and we've got some very interesting speakers coming in. We have uh, Anutin Chanbirakun, who is the head of the Boomchai Thai Party, took over from Nawin Chichop, uh, and he's one of the people who is tipped as a possible future prime minister, so this is a very interesting person. His views on the economy are obviously of great interest. Uh, and we have also uh, Tom Crisopon, who was uh, in the Per Thai government with uh, Taksin uh, and is now an independent businessman, a very interesting speaker. And we have one other person who has not confirmed, so I'm not going to say who it is. Um, and the following week, we have another very big program coming up, which is a look at what's been going on in the Philippines um, and the, the de Declaration of Martial Law there. Uh, a new dimension in the very old uh, Muslim rebellion in Mindanao. Um, and we're going to have a lot of people coming who've, who've been there uh, and some regional analysts. Um, the the centre of that programme will be whether or not there's a new Islamic front opening up in Southeast Asia, which was the subject of the Shangri-La dialogue in Singapore last weekend, the hot topic there. Um, and some analysts believe that there are already 1,200 Islamic State-affiliated uh, terrorists in the Philippines and that there are some 31 organizations with connections already active in Southeast Asia. So that's a huge story uh, for the future, keep everybody busy. Uh, the week after that, we'll take a look at uh, forestry encroachment, which is a big domestic issue, and a nice program that's coming up in... Um, early July is um, Chris Baker and his wife uh, Ajahn Pasuk have just brought out um, a history of Ayutthaya, the kingdom that preceded the Bangkok era uh, and amazingly nobody's ever done it before and so uh, Chris Baker will be here with some other very distinguished historians and he'll talk not just about Ayutthaya but how history uh, is covered in Thailand which is a huge topic and one that he feels very passionately about. And so to this evening, um, this program might look as if it bounced off an incident at Sawanapum Airport um, a few days back. But in fact, uh, we'd been planning to have a program uh, on Mosul and the battle for Mosul for quite some time. And we'd never actually been able to get um, the correspondence that we wanted to be here at one time. So rather fortunately, the Thai police have uh, stepped in and... and detain them in Bangkok <laughs> and so as their first punishment they are now actually uh, going to have to present themselves at the Foreign Correspondence Club and we also welcome Quentin Somerville. So just quickly um, we have sitting here Nick Millard who is one of the BBC's most senior, seasoned cameramen and a recipient of a number of industry accolades including a prestigious Royal Television Award uh, as Camera Operator of the Year in 2006. That's big stuff in, in the trade. Uh, he's a veteran of Afghanistan, Bosnia, the Middle East, um, and, of course, most recently, Iraq, as it's turned around. Uh, sitting next to me here is Tony Cheng, who's a familiar face in Bangkok. He's had a 20-year career in the BBC, uh, working at the Chinese uh, World Service. Uh, and after that, he had five years as Al Jazeera's bureau chief in Beijing. Um, and of late, he's been working more independently uh, and assignments have taken in some extremely dangerous areas, including Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, the Ukraine, and Iraq. Uh, and most of his recent assignments have been for the, the state uh, a news agency in China, which is China Global Television Network, which used to be CCTV. And then we have uh, sitting on the other end, Florian Witalski, who's a, a German journalist and documentary maker, who's been uh, in Bangkok since 2008, 
and carved out a reputation for himself in 2010 with the political somersaults going on here and taking outrageous risks. Um, but anyway, he's also been covering the Middle East for Al Jazeera, BBC, uh, CGTN, uh, The Economist, um, and his hostile environment uh, assignments were taken to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq. Uh, and in Iraq, he's been following the rise and fall of the Islamic State since 2014. And then a late addition to the panel, but very welcome, Quentin Somerville of the BBC, who has uh, a career in the BBC dating back from 2001. Uh, and he's been posted to China, he's covered Afghanistan, the Middle East, and you will have seen um, his coverage of, of Mosul uh, if you watch any BBC coverage at all. Um, what we're going to do this evening is have a look, first of all, at Mosul, um, because that's the story and that's what everybody's interested in. Uh, and then when we've gone through that, we're going to take a look at how uh, journalists cover it, specifically in relation to the need for body armour. So, um, Nick, can I kick off with you? Uh, is everything set up? Yeah, everything's set up to go. Florian's in charge of your footage. Yeah, so we I think just start it. And then we'll talk. So we've got about six, six or seven clips of Mosul. In a battle for a city this big, progress isn't always easy to map. After five weeks of fighting, much of Mosul has still to be retaken. Below, in miniature, the we get the volume up. Out. In Mosul streets, life or death is decided in the blink of an eye. Just metres away, the so-called Islamic State. In no man's land, a dead body. Iraqi special forces say he was an IS fighter, one of a dozen they've shot dead this week. Yes, many civilians have been attacked by Islamic State snipers, but they also use them as human shields. It's very difficult for us. They sometimes come forward carrying babies, using them as cover. Nearby, a car bomb detonates. The only safe way past this front line is through walls, homes and backyards. We're right at the very edge here. The Islamic State are 200 metres in that direction. And look over here. You can see children running, children playing. People are living 20 metres away from here. Yesterday there was a car bomb. No military were injured, just civilians. This war is happening on people's doorsteps. At house after house, white flags are raised. Where else could these children and their families go? An exodus would cause a humanitarian disaster for Iraq. Even the people who were uh, influenced by their, by their talk, by the ISIS talk, now they are not, because they, they endured two years of suffering, they endured two years of deprivation, two years of killing. Okay. So, despite the war, the government has asked people to stay. But still, suspicion runs high here. Five days of fighting means Amar Jazan and his family haven't left their house. But his wife Rana is about to give birth. I lost a baby in these circumstances. I lost the baby because the doctors were not available. I don't know how I'm coping, but I pray it will get better. For three-year-old Azel, it will be her first time leaving Mosul. The government wants people to remain here, but it and its services are mostly absent. So today, it's an armoured Humvee that serves as an ambulance. <laughs> Safar Kallis' father watches in disbelief. His son has just been shot in the chest. 
an IS sniper's bullet, say his brothers. They'd left their house only a few minutes ago to sell eggs. Nothing can be done. It's gone. And the appalling truth is that Safar's death is one of hundreds here every week. This is the horror of this situation. They can't even take the boy's body down the street because they're worried that the sniper is still down there. You can hear the gunfire all around. You can hear the heartbroken family inside there. A million people are still trapped in this city and the fighting is going on all around them. And this is the moment his brothers realise that Safar is gone. And while people remain here, much more will have to be endured. The fight for Mosul has only just begun. Quentin Somerville, BBC News, Mosul. as many questions as possible, really, rather than just having a drone on. But I think one of the defining things about Mosul is covering it as a journalist is the access you're given is quite extraordinary. And where normally, you know, you're fighting to get up to the front to get access to pictures. In, in Mosul, you're having to really self-filter about how far you go and, and when you have enough. Um, and, you know, one of the other things about it is the fact that, as Quentin says in the report, um, you know, it's happening right in the middle of a civilian population. There are people are just all around you. So, I mean, you, you kind of want to be as close to the battle and amongst, the bat you know, as much as possible, but you've just really got to have your head screwed on about how far you push that. Yeah, and the um, the thing about that was that was the easy bit. That was East Mosul. That that wasn't the toughest fighting. And the toughest fighting is now taking place in the w in, in the west. And um, you know, one of the things that's been very striking about covering that particular war, it's been very fulfilling in a way because, unlike, for example, our reporting on Aleppo, we weren't able to go to Aleppo. We couldn't be there. So you're always removed and it's always very difficult to know who's telling the truth or who's lying to you less there. The amazing thing about Mosul was that we were right there. You know, you could feel, you know, we were there, what, two weeks in the front line? Like that? Well, on, on that trip, yeah. Yeah, that trip, two weeks there. Right on the front line. And, you know, there were car bombs going off. <clears throat> all the time and that that poor young man um, he was around the corner from us he didn't have body armor um and then we walked back you know and they didn't have medics either um it's a member of our team who had to treat him a member of our team tried to to save his life but there was nothing to be done he had a hole here and everything was coming out of his mouth and obviously we couldn't show that for the 10 o'clock news um, I, he died very quickly, uh, and you saw you saw the reaction. Um, the wail that came from the woman inside the house was just oh, was astonishing. And the men were holding the door because they were overcome with emotion, and they wanted to come out, and they and it just simply wasn't safe for them. It's got a lot worse for civilians in Mosul since then, certainly in West Mosul, and. Uh, before coming here, and as a result of the body armour issue, we've sent out notes to other correspondents, to pretty much everybody who was there, whether it was Sky News, ITV News, or all, the, all my other BBC colleagues. And one thing that we all say about Mosul was it's the most dangerous thing that any of us have done. That's Orla Gearin, Alex Crawford from Sky, Jeremy Bowen from the BBC. It was a level of danger that... I've just never, I've never experienced it's nothing. It's off the scale. Yeah, it's, 
uh, and relentless. Um, and I think we're going to show you another piece now, which is a bit more kinetic, as the military say, in terms of pushing forward. And, that, and this is in West Mosul. And this is just before we got into West Mosul proper. It was the last stop before getting into the city proper. It was the uh, taking the airport. IS fought back. First, a huge roadside bomb which killed an Iraqi officer. Despite the airstrikes, IS fighters were still putting up resistance. From the cover of an armoured vehicle, we were able to see the battle ahead. civilians they meet and they're in a wretched state. These people had hung on during years of Islamic State group rule, but in the midst of this final battle, they were overwhelmed. <laughs> this man says they're dead. He's all dead. My brother has already gone to the camp. He's heartbroken. Six of his family were killed in an airstrike. Alhamdulillah. This is the last open ground before West Mosul. The desert and farmland here made for swift progress. Iraqi forces are now less than a mile away from the city. They're also in range of mortars from IS. But it's the Islamic State that's under threat. Mosul airport may be in ruins, but more importantly, it's back in government hands. Over there, it's the Iraqi flag that's flying on the airfield again. This is a landmark moment. Iraqi forces now have the Islamic State group on the run. IS might transform itself into something else, but right now, here in Iraq, we are witnessing the final days of the Caliphate. Quentin Somerville, BBC News, Mosul Airport. Mosul is being broken by war to smash the ambition of Islamic State. We drove through streets taken back from IS in the last few days. The jihadists seized Mosul in 2014, posing as the liberators of Sunni Muslims. Instead, they imposed a nightmare. And trying to end it, Mohammed Adil was 50 meters from an IS sniper. It is a street battle. We advance in teams from house to house. The enemy is very aggressive, using snipers and car bombs. Fighting in a built-up area is the toughest job a soldier can do. Casualties are inevitable. Mosul is a big city, which makes it worse. Both sides are moving along passages, not through walls, because open ground is dangerous. Through homes whose owners left in a hurry. Dresses still hung in a cupboard. The command center was in the living room. The fighting has become room to room, not house to house. They are surrounded, either they fight or surrender. They're not surrendering. It's 
close quarter combat. He had two hand grenades ready. Could heavy airstrikes help them? They're politically difficult. Especially now the Americans say their coalition probably killed at least 150 civilians. This fight is every bit as hard and slow and difficult as was predicted. But these soldiers seem capable and they're pushing forward, they're determined. Their enemies are around 20 meters away. They are French, Saudis, Chechens, but mainly French and Saudis. When we call them, we find their identity cards. And now civilians, when they can, queue for handouts. On this street, they said it's better than when jihadists came here to build their caliphate, to start a war to supersede Islamic countries. And Iraqis absorb more pain. Um, you know, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Bowden says that uh, you don't just go to war for the sake of it. You don't, um, it's intrusive, it's uh, prurient almost to turn up on the worst day of somebody's life just because you want to be a war correspondent. So why do we do it? Well, the reason we do it is because this, is, this battle is the battle of our times against the Islamic State. And there's a very important point here because we sent, the British media sent more journalists to cover that story than anyone else except for Iraq. We don't have British soldiers fighting and dying there. There's some special forces, there's some trainers. Um, but it's such an important battle that we committed huge resources there, despite the fact that this was the most dangerous circumstances that any of us have been, been in. And we went back, and we went back, and we went back again. And body armor is pretty important in those circumstances. Um, in the previous piece, I think it was, you didn't see it, it was at the top of the piece, but, or maybe it was another day, it all kind of blends into one. But um, and we heard that chap talking about the snipers. Uh, they're very good. Uh, they're so good, in fact, that when we were out one day, we were in an armoured Humvee, and the gunner, and the, the top gunner, he was protected, but the sniper found the, the seam in the armour plating and shot him through that, shot him in the backside. He was fine, uh, hurt a bit. But, um, you know, it really is the... Uh, Quentin, you were saying that, the, that this is the last days of the Caliphate and, you know, the, the Battle of Our Times. Now, who is IS? Who are you actually covering? Who is on the other side of that wall at the moment? Who well, they are, I mean, despite what the, this, the, despite what the officer said in Jeremy's report, they always say, oh, it's French, and it's certainly the, the snipers seem to be Chechen, but it's mostly Iraqis that, are, that have, have taken up arms uh, for lots of different reasons. Uh, the Islamic State, as we know, are very good at finding gaps in societies. They've done it in Libya, they've done it in Syria, and they've done it in Iraq. And when they get in, they widen that gap and they exploit it. And you know, one of the things that puzzled us before Mosul started, for years we were talking about Mosul and we expected this big battle to come. We all thought, what the hell is going on inside Mosul? What is it like? It's an enormous city. I flew over it just before the battle began and I thought it would be dark. And, but it was like flying over London. It was a massive, brightly lit city of a million people. And when we went in, we discovered what IS had been doing for those past couple of years. They'd been preparing for this moment. Every neighborhood, you would find a massive stockpile of very well-made weaponry, mortars, etc., etc. They turned the entire city into an arsenal, they, and they weaponized Mosul. When, when the Iraqi army fled, they fled in a hurry, and they left behind an awful lot of equipment, American equipment, that had been supplied to them. And that's... That's what they're fighting with at the minute. It's a lot of what they're fighting with. And, and they're improvising it into, you know, sort of attaching 
grenades to drones and just just drones you can buy off the shelf, uh, toy drones, and and using it to to drop on people there. It, Mosul's now been going on longer than Stalingrad, um, and it isn't done yet. You know, the Islamic State are losing, They're, and they will be defeated there. They'll transform into something else. I think. Um, the um, the battle for Mosul's been going on since October, so we're now what, eight months into it. Yeah. So more than that. Yeah. Uh, you say the closing days. What what are you predicting? How many days? How many weeks are left? I've what what is I've a realistic? I don't no. think it's weeks. I've always said it would take a year. A year. I think I think a year. Yeah. Everybody keeps telling me that the Al Nuri Mosque, which is uh, which is where Baghdadi gave his sermon just after declaring the caliph, mm. the caliphate was declared that it's about to fall, but they've been saying that for months and months. I think, and even when it falls, then uh, there's the battle in uh, Talafar, then we have Raqqa in Syria, then you have the Euphrates, the river valley, which has to be taken from IS. There's a lot of very hard fighting. And when we talk about Raqqa, which is next, it's 3D terrain. Mosul is pretty much flat. Mm. It's smaller, it's much smaller, but again, They've been getting ready for this moment for years. All right, should we go, uh, Florian, to your, you're ready to shoot? So we'll see what you have. The city of Mosul, wreathed in smoke. William fires burn across the west. There's gunfire that continues to crack. The Iraqi special forces were heading to the front line. And heavily armored Humvees weaving through the wreckage of the city. Roads ripped apart by IEDs, artillery shells, mortars, and their streets. Although these neighborhoods have been taken by the security forces, they remain dangerous and hostile. Their objective, the neighborhood of Nablus, claimed by the Iraqis two days ago. Commander Lieutenant General Al-Sadi going to check on their progress and his men. But the fighting is now door to door. They weave their way through the labyrinth of dark corridors. Tents. Their enemy. Their new meters away. ground is controlled by the snipers, watching, waiting. Just one street away, an ISIS position, and they were an enemy, proving very difficult to dislodge. We've taken out about 10 or 11, but when I kill one, the others run to the left and right. Trap bombs are one of the greatest dangers. But booby traps and snipers are on late too. So I asked the general when the neighborhood would be under their control. We have no exact time frame, so the operation is ongoing. But they have one very major advantage, and that is proving to be decisive. And there's what? Something. Airstrike. Something. Airstrike. Okay. US-led coalition airstrikes are being used to dislodge ISIS fighters that the ground troops can't reach. The spotters calling in attacks as jets way above unleash their payload. A second strike to finish the job. We've just been following the general for a short while and you can see how active the battle zone is here. We've seen two airstrikes, heavy artillery, automatic machine gun fire. And clearly, for any civilians still living here, this is a living hell, even though there are estimated to be half a million people still in the city. Many have fled, but more remain, barricaded inside their homes. The bodies of dead ISIS fighters still lying in the street. The soldiers do what they can to reassure but it's little comfort. At the closest first aid center, the latest casualty is treated. 
11-year-old Fahd, injured by shrapnel from volume. an ISIS mortar. As the battle rages, these are the people paying the price of the war. Blaster. Slightly odd volume on this, I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, that, that was our, uh, I think that was our second piece when we got there. We were there about a month after you guys had on your trip, uh, in, at the end of March. Uh, to, to give you a bit of background, we had, uh, I mean, we, we don't have the kind of resources the BB, BBC has. Um, so we were just there trying our luck, basically. Uh, we had a very good fixer. We'd, we'd been with the special forces the day before. They'd taken a fatality, uh, so it wasn't, we weren't able to go in with them. On this morning, we drove in from Erbil, headed into their headquarters, and they just said, come with us. And there is, you know, when you're doing this, there is a, there's a huge unpredictability about what you're going to see. You, you can't really plan anything. You just go with them uh, and hope for the best. Now. I'd actually had a, a lot of good advice from Quentin, who'd, who'd advised me who to go with, who to be wary of. With the special forces, they're generally very responsible, and you know they're not going to put you in too much harm, but the federal police, who are now operating, I think, principally in, in the old city, um, I, I mean, I, I, we didn't go with them. I've seen footage, and it's just insane. They, they'll take you into places and start firing off rockets and stuff, which, uh, and then get caught out. So you have to be very careful. The airstrike, for example, I think you can see it. It took us completely by surprise. Uh, we're just standing on a roof, and it's a block away. And that was coming in from an F-16. It was a huge explosion. There was shrapnel and debris falling on our heads for about two minutes afterwards. As it turned out, it was very fortuitous in the journalistic sense, because three days later, there was a strike on a house uh, which, again, I think is still in dispute somewhat, but in which there were uh, more than 100 civilians. So we actually had very visual footage of, um, of something that became a very major news point. But, but you just don't know what's going to happen. And the other interesting thing, which we hadn't appreciated, or I certainly hadn't, I don't know if Florian had noticed it, but when we were doing that weaving in through, through the houses, I had been aware that there was gunfire going on, but it wasn't until we got back and started looking at the rushes that I realized just how much there was, and it was constant. And I think Florian's got some outtakes here, should we play that now, which, <coughs> which just shows how much gunfire there is going on. And yeah. there was the car bomb and everything else. Yeah, uh, so the next clip is just gonna be, um, basically it's just some raw footage I put together. It's just a few minutes. Uh, because I think a lot of people, um, at least from my friends, I get a lot of questions how it actually looks in terms of logistics at a front line, like how do you get there, how do you walk around, mm. how does it all work? Uh, so this maybe gives you a little bit of an insight how it is to walk around there, because I mean you have many open areas which you really have to avoid, so you have to go quickly through the open areas, but the main fighting, which is still going on at the moment in Mosul, is really door to door. It's really, it goes through people's backyards, it goes through little rooms. Uh, I mean, all these special divisions, they set up little centers in people's houses, uh, have their little antennas and computers they plan from there, call in airstrikes from there. So it really all goes, just like if you imagine through Bangkok, it goes through house, from house to house. So maybe this gives you a little bit of a, uh, an insight how it looks. So this was the day when we went out. We went first by Humvee to get closer to Mosul. And here, as you see, it goes to like backyards, like people's gardens. You have to do a lot of climbing, a lot of going through holes. It's like physically, it's actually quite challenging, especially. Which is not easy with body armor. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like body armor pulls you down another not many kilos, but yeah. Hello, 
inside. These look like deserted areas, but it's actually a lot of snipers that look out for these open areas. Uh, and as Tony said, um, often if you're in this situation, you don't really notice how much things are going on around you in terms of shootings. Like in these situations, you're like really concerned about getting down this ladder, going to your <laughs> next position, <laughs> and you don't really listen to all of this, um, all of these things that are going on. Another problem in these areas, if you go through from house to house, there's a lot of booby traps, a lot of mines and like traps that ISIS set. So that's another thing the soldiers always have to be worried of, like um, how things um, are in the next room. <laughs> And this special division is always uh, in touch uh, with other teams and mostly they go up to high ground to coordinate um, airstrikes. Yeah, so those were just a few like um, raw clips to just give you an idea how it is to walk around there. Um, we have uh, another piece that's um, a little bit of a, gives you a little bit of a different perspective as well. Um, because since this battle has been going on for so long in Mosul, um, there's a lot of families that actually fled Mosul but now moved back to be back in their house because they just want to be at home even though it's right at the front line. So um, we had one day where we visited a family and uh, we just spent the day with them and just um, yeah, had a had a look on how life is if you really live on the front line. And this and, uh, uh, th actually the opening shots and the family lived just down the road from the airport that Quentin's second piece was in. Uh, um, what maybe half a kilometer away? Yeah, right maybe at the airport. And actually, if you look at the opening shots, they're pretty much from where you did that piece of camera, a little bit further in, but. Inside the western part of the city, a panorama of destruction. Who could imagine living amongst this? The Hazim family came home on the day after their house was retaken by government troops. What they found is a shock. They destroyed all of this. Their house had been taken over by ISIL fighters for three years. Look, there were posters here, and look, Islamic State. 
Sudan was a truck driver, but he hasn't worked for three years. This was his dream home. This is what they left behind. They destroyed everything. It was a beautiful house, but they destroyed it. But they haven't given up. When the situation is stabilized, I will rebuild the house. It's going to take time. The damage is extensive. This happened when the offensive started. When the army attacked ISIL, a rocket hit this wall. His wife Shima is doing her best with the few supplies that she can get. She can't remember the last time they ate meat. But she's grateful her kids are now safe. We kept them separated, even from ISIL schools. We wouldn't let them attend. They were so different from the ordinary schools. Everything they taught was about weapons, shotguns. Everything was about violence. It was brainwashing, she says. The kids do seem happy and relaxed, despite the constant noise and fighting. But as her parents talk, Jawa fiddles with a toy gun, unusual for a seven-year-old girl. And there aren't many playmates for the kids. A lot of these houses are being used by the security forces who are fighting further inside the city. The original residents still too afraid to return home. And Shima's family only escaped yesterday from ISIL-held territory. They were captured and used as human shields for four days. There is no food, no water. They couldn't eat or drink, no clothes, nothing. Life was impossible. Outside, there's an impromptu firework display. This is a reaction from ISIL to hit the air support. But 14-year-old Ibrahim is dismissive. They can't hit it, he says. They're way off target. There was a, a, a deeply, deeply disturbing moment when we were shooting this, which we didn't include. When the little girl is playing with the gun, at a certain point, she puts it up to her head and pulls the trigger. And then she does the same to her little brother, who was three or four. And it, 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 was, it was just so disturbing. I think I, I've never seen anything quite as horrible as that. Um, and although the parents had protected them. And the parents, I think, were, were quite comfortable there and, and were, were relatively assured the family was okay. You could just see that there was a trauma in these children which was going to go on for, for years and years to come. It was very disturbing. But I, I think in that piece, we were also acutely aware that a lot of the coverage coming out featured this, this very active battlefield, which we had done in the first piece. We were trying very much to to pull back a little bit. Uh, you saw I wasn't wearing my body armor there, which uh, uh, probably quite a few people would chastise me for, but we were, we're trying not to make it about the battle, but about the people who were living there. And it was, and they had a, a mortar emplacement in their back garden. The amount of just gunfire going off all around was, was quite astonishing. And the fact that it didn't affect them. I was twitching every time a round was going off, but the kids and the parents were fine. Yeah. Where, where is this coverage, your coverage, being shown? <laughs> where, where would people be seeing it? Uh, well, it, it goes on CGTM, but we also get packaged up and put out on Reuters and AP. So probably that's where... So it gets quite good distribution. Yeah. yeah. If you go back to the Vietnam War, um, there was this big criticism that the media basically lost the war um, for the American military because it was on, you know, the, the doorstep of, of everybody in America and they disapproved of the war. Is, what is your feeling about the impact of your coverage in terms of the people that see it? Is, is there a great awareness that this extraordinary nightmare, this medieval thing is going on? Or I think is there strange I mean, if you look at all of, the, all of the conflict zones that are around the world today, we get this kind of access. Um, you know, it is, it is astonishing, as, as Nick and Quentin said, that you can 
drive up to the front line and there you are and, it, and it's all there. But you know, I've, I've seen the same thing in, in Libya and Syria to a certain extent. You know, as long as you have the desire to get there, you usually can. I mean, there are an awful lot of dangers in the way. And actually, in that sense, Mosul is probably safer because you're, if you're in the areas controlled by the security forces, you can be relatively safe. You don't have competing factions. The, the I was just going to say, there are some places like Yemen, for example, which is, um, as Sebastian will tell you, that there's, there's more people at risk in Yemen than in Iraq or Syria, and it's very, very difficult for us to cover because there's a huge kidnap risk. Um, and it's very, the Saudis don't want you in there, and you're looking at a 50-hour boat ride to get in there, and even then, that's not guaranteed. And that's so, you know, there's... A, you know, I'd say in that sense, Iraq is, it's, it's very dangerous, but it's easier mm. logistically to do. But there, there are a lot of places that we just can't get to very easily. And I think and also the interconnectedness of all of this is very important. And I think that's why it's, it's, it's why we're investing so much in covering these stories, because who would have thought that the war in Syria would have caused the, the flood of migration that we've, we haven't seen in our lifetime? Mm which is still continuing. Uh, and it's, very, it's always very difficult sometimes with audiences and with editors sometimes to, to remind them why, why you should give a shit about what's going on in Libya yeah. or in Iraq or in Syria. And you know, then something like Manchester happens or something like London happens. And, and, and I think we have a duty and a responsibility to show that also the people who are doing the fighting and the dying principally are Muslims, uh, but are Iraqis and Syrians, mm -hmm. and in some cases Libyans. That unit that we were with at the beginning, uh, was it ISAF 1? The, the counter-terrorism forces, ISAF 1, I think it was. They started off with 450 men. They're down to 150 now. That's an incredible attrition rate. You know, that's almost unsustainable, and that's why they had to take a pause. That's why they keep having to take pauses, because they're just losing so many men. And those units, as Tony mentioned, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty effective soldiers, mm. some of the most effective soldiers I've seen in, in the Middle East. Um, but the, it's coming at a tremendous, tremendous cost. Right, before we go on to the, the body armour thing, um, Tony, give us, give us an idea of the route in from Bangkok. What do you do to get to Mosul? Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, when you succeed, take yeah. the bus. Well, do you mean uh, in the future or in the past? Well, you're going to find uh, out tomorrow. Well, what, what are you planning I mean, to do tomorrow? Yeah? <laughs> um, I mean, basically, when you go, the, uh, when we go to these places, a lot of the time you don't really know what you're going to find. So you know, there's a conflict there. And, and again, when Florian and I do this, we don't have a risk assessment team. We don't have. Uh, well, <laughs> I know, it, it, I mean, my experience in the BBC has, has taught me in the past that it can be a bit of a pain, but, you know, just somebody who's aware of this, CCTV is a very well-established organisation, but it, it has not really in the past branched out into this kind of global news. It's, it's been in, interested in internal issues in China. I think the Chinese are very keen to now project themselves onto the world, and to that end, they understand that you know, they, they have to start showing this kind of thing within China, and it's also broadcast around the world. So, but, but they haven't realized just how complicated this is. The BBC, of course, has decades of experience. I've thankfully worked for a long time with the BBC and with Al Jazeera, both organizations that have a very professional approach to this. CCTV have been very helpful in providing resources for us, but, but when you think about it, you, you really have to think in terms of being self-reliant. And I think when we look at journalism today, you know, I started with a big media organization, and, and as the years have gone on, the crews that I've worked with have shrunk, the amount of resources available have shrunk, and the reality is, as I've found in places like Iraq and, and Syria and Libya, it's often just one guy in a camera who's you know, got a commission to do something who has never been to this place, doesn't speak the language, often can't even afford a fixer or transport, who's just winging it. And that can be incredibly dangerous. Um, 
because you just don't know what you're going to find. So to go back to your original question, I, I try and prepare the ground as much as I can. Uh, I try to find good people where I'm going who will be fixers, drivers, translators. But again, that can be very variable. And again, when you go to places like this, you have, you know, there are, there, there are all sorts of traps awaiting you. You get the wrong fixer and they can take, you know, you're a very high value target. They can sell you, literally, for an awful lot of money. So you have to be very careful about all of these things. I try and speak to, you know, other people in the business, friends, colleagues, to get a good sense of what I'm gonna meet when I get there. But even then, you're, you're just taking a giant leap into the unknown. So one of the things that you can be assured about, or you should be able to be assured about, is making sure that you have that level of protection at, you know, just around you. And this is why it is so very important. If I go back to Iraq, I know I can borrow a vest. I know I can borrow a helmet. I don't know where it's been. I don't know what level of protection it affords me. I don't know how old it is. Don't know if it fits. If it fits. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's... <laughs> but, well, as Nick had told me the other day, he's just had his tailor made to fit his uh, rather more slender than my um, six foot six frame. Mm. But it, it is very important. And also, it, it's just, it's yours. And you know that it's there. And when you're throwing yourself into the unknown, those little bits of certainty are very, very important. Also, can I just say, you know, in the last 10 years, 800 journalists have been killed doing their job. And, you know, we're a target in a way that we never were before. Uh, we're being kidnapped and killed at a rate we were, ne we were never killed before. Um, in the most brutal and appalling fashion. So any preparation and protection that you can provide yourself when you're in those situations. And also when you're dealing with the likes of ISIS, they don't play nice. Hmm. Um, Actually, you had your, we, we have these uh, Velcro straps on our jackets which say press, and I saw you had yours on. We were advised to take ours off hmm. because it marks you out as a target and they'll yeah. go for you. Yeah, I think they're gonna shoot you anyway, frankly, if they see you. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, the, on our last day, well, my last day, and you went back in with Jeremy, we were, uh, I mean, generally when you're in a battlefield, you have a, f a fair degree of what's going on around you in terms of incoming and outgoing fire, mortars, maybe machine gun fire, where not to step with IEDs, with roadside bombs, um, and, and all that jazz. And w when we actually, on our last day there, we, uh, broke through the perimeter into, um, into West Mosul proper. And uh, it was Nick's great idea. He said, let's get out of the armored vehicle and, <laughs> and do some filming. And as we did, um, am I allowed to talk about this? I am, right? Yeah. I so. <laughs> Nick's family's You've here. you started. Yeah, I've started. <laughs> um, as we were, we went behind, it was, in, it was the midst of a bloody battle. You know, there were two Abrams tanks firing. There were mortars incoming and outgoing. There was machine gun fire everywhere. Perfect time to step out of an armoured vehicle. Um, we were behind a building. We took we, the decision that this was... We, this was a safe place. We were behind a building. <laughs> there were some Iraqi security forces there, and we were interviewing them. And while I st when I started asking the captain questions, I noticed that he was finding it difficult to hear me, and he leant forward and cupped his ear because the gunfire suddenly got very loud. And then suddenly from nowhere there was a flash, and our security guy got hit. He's fine, just a little flesh wound. Um, and we got back in the vehicle and got buggered off out of there as quickly as possible. And it was only, and as we were driving out somewhere safe, I'd noticed that the gunner on the Humvee had closed the, uh, he closed the hatch. So he was sitting outside the Humvee, manning his gun, but we were safe inside. And it was only later that evening we found out what had happened. And IS had sent over a bloody drone. And they had these 40 millimeter grenades. And we thought we were, fine behind this wall, but they saw us, they flew their drone off, and they dropped a grenade. Unfortunately, it wasn't too close. It just gave Baz a bit of a flesh wound, but, you know, they don't play nice, and... It was clear that we were conducting an interview. I mean, even, Yeah, yeah even they, they, they could see us. They knew what we were doing, and that, you know, I guess they went to get the news that night. But, um, you know, there is a... 
they are a fantastically formidable uh, enemy for the Iraqi security forces. And they're resourceful. Um, and as I said before, you know, they've turned that city into a giant arsenal. So, you know, in some of those pieces to camera, I don't wear my helmet because, you know, it doesn't look great wearing a helmet on TV. But in Mosul, I was wearing my helmet a lot <laughs> because you just, it, it's coming at you from everywhere. And, uh, Right, well, on, um, we've got one more piece to show from you guys. Uh, yes, it actually connects quite well because Quentin just talked about all the things that are quite of unexpected that you mm. don't really expect, like drones or things like that. Um, and Tony went out, uh, Tony and I went out one day and uh, we were supposed to, uh, we had the idea to film this mass grave that is uh, near Mosul. And um, we basically had nothing else planned out and when we got there we was kind of like a kind of desolated area there was nothing going on there so we we're not really sure what to do with that story but it quite of turned uh, so maybe you just have a look and then uh, and this was our closest call of the trip which doesn't look quite as dramatic but uh, a barren and desolate land named Haspen ISIL staged a fierce defense here before retreating into the city so fierce that fires still burn a month after they fled Iraqi soldiers show us where they burned pits of oil, the thick smoke hiding their positions from airstrikes. But they may have been hiding something else, too. About 400 meters down the road here is a large sinkhole, a natural depression that goes deep down into the ground. It was being used as an execution ground by ISIL. They brought civilians here from Mosul who had disobeyed their rules. But nobody knows exactly how many people are inside because you can't go any further than this. The whole area is very heavily mined. As we filmed, we were careful to stay on the road. We hadn't noticed, just a meter away, something buried in the dirt. A Russian TM-46 anti-tank mine. We met a man who'd worked in a factory nearby. He told us locals estimate more than 3,000 people had been killed and thrown into the pit. Informers, adulterers, and infidels. We heard the screams of the people who were brought there, civilians, and then they were killed. But the hills will keep their secret for now. Inside eastern Mosul, some sort of normality has returned since the Iraqi army took control. Shortages are a problem, but many people have returned, despite the bitter fighting in the west. But normality is something Nashwan Yassin will never know again. He lives on the edge of Mosul with his sick mother and brothers. But he spends most of his time alone in the room that's become his sanctuary and his prison. He was arrested in July last year as Iraqi forces prepared to retake the city. He was caught with a mobile phone and cigarettes. The cigarettes are haram, forbidden. But because of the phone, he was accused of being a spy. They beat him for days and electrocuted him so badly he now speaks with a slur. Then he shows me the paper they gave him, saying he'd been found guilty of theft. The phone, they said, wasn't his. The punishment under ISIL's brutal law was to have his hand cut off. In public, there was no defense. I didn't want to come home because I didn't want my family to see me like this. Now I hide myself in this room. I don't want to see anyone. I was as free as bird. Now I can't bear to look at myself. Now Nashwan hides himself away because of shame, bearing scars that will likely never heal. Crime and punishment in the Islamic State. <laughs> I'm going to move it along a bit now. We've, um, because of what happened uh, at the airport with uh, Florian and Tony, um, and also six days before, which we didn't know at the time, a Czech correspondent was uh, intercepted and arrested, and he's being charged. That's separate, but he's keeping a very low profile. Uh, and it's a repeat of something that happened in 2015 when a, a Canadian um, Chinese photographer was caught taking flak jackets out of Thailand 
and he was uh, charged and he, he went to court, but it was dropped by the Attorney General quietly at the end. Uh, Florian is fine. Um, they, they let him go. Tony has been charged and faces technically up to five years in jail. He's out on 100,000 baht bail. Anyway, this, this was addressed before. There were efforts tried, made to try and clear up this problem and, and work out a modus operandi so that this sort of thing that wastes everybody's time wouldn't happen again. But it has, and we don't know what's, where it will lead. But it's triggered uh, an outpouring of support for uh, people who are based in Thailand, uh, which is the only country, as far as we know, that has this kind of very uh, punitive approach to the use of body armor, uh, gas masks, which are classified under a 1987 law as being um, military equipment, weaponry, essentially. So anyway, I'm just going to read. We've, we've had about 15 people write quite long notes with their feelings about it. And the, this will be th these notes, this testimony, will be circulated uh, from the FCCT. And I'm not going to read it all out, but there's some very interesting stuff here. So we have Stuart Ramsey, who's the chief correspondent of Sky News. Uh, and he's been reporting on conflicts across the globe for the past 25 years, taking in 18 different wars. I'm currently in Mosul. From my experience, I have concluded that coverage of the current Iraqi-led assault on the Islamic State forces in the city is the single most dangerous assignment I have ever been given. The threat of direct and indirect fire, suicide attacks, concealed improvised devices, and chemical weapons attacks is so severe that all normal rules of coverage barely apply. High-level body armor, helmets, gas masks, armored vehicles, and extensive personal medical equipment are an absolute requirement. Without this support equipment, working in the Mosul battle space would be impossible, and frankly, no company would ever allow a deployment to take place. As a journalist, I am required to travel the world through the airports and ports of many different countries, and we are all dependent on the authorities of those countries assisting in our safe passage and the passage of our equipment, without which we cannot work. Our job is to expose the horrors of war, to educate the public, and to bear witness to the actions of the combatants and their governments. We are not part of the war, and nor is our equipment. It was very eloquent. Um, Chris Kemp, who is the head of uh, high risk and new safety for the BBC, sent another note, and he said that since the start of the Mosul Offensive in October 2016, the BBC has deployed over 50 reporting teams to cover the story, which is what uh, Quentin was telling us. Whilst these teams have covered all aspects of the operation, the majority have been focused on frontline news coverage for worldwide audiences. From a safety perspective, this has been a particularly dangerous environment. Fighting has been intense throughout, but particularly since the Iraqi war forces entered the built-up area, where the complex urban environment lends itself perfectly to the defensive tactics used by IS. We have seen the almost continuous use of artillery, mortars, heavy machine guns, snipers, IEDs, booby traps, and even armed drones. Coalition ground attacks, uh, attack fighters and helicopters are heavily engaged. Then um, he talks about the BBC safety policy, which is more detail than we need at the moment. But just to bring it home, we have uh, in this building, Al Jazeera has its bureau downstairs where Scott Heidler is, and he sent a note. And he said, over more than two decades as a journalist, I've spent a great deal of time in conflict, conflict zones in the Middle East and South Asia. Not only was my personal protective gear, ceramic plated flak vest and Kevlar helmet always at my side, it was critical get, that the gear fit properly and was properly maintained. If either are compromised, the protection from the equipment is diminished. Hence the importance of having your own gear so it can do what it is designed to do, which is save your life. Um, Paula Bronstein, who is based in Bangkok, uh, a very famous photojournalist, a long time with Getty, uh, she writes, I have covered Afghanistan extensively for 16 years and normally take protective gear, but not anymore until this situation is off. She means take it through the airport. Bangkok is a base for many of us to jump off into many conflict zones, not just Mosul. We may live in Thailand, but for us, many, for, but many of us work in uh, is elsewhere, and we have to travel with our kit. In war zones, body armor is essential. It is, it is expensive, protective equipment that can make the difference between life and death. I have a flak jacket that is made for my size body. Very hard to find. 
Body armor has to fit properly so you can't just grab anything as a replacement. One would hope that a panel would, would, that a panel would explain how this law needs to be overturned and there needs to be some logic to it. So she's talking about um, what should be done next. Then to give it a bit of a historical perspective, we have Dennis Gray, who's the retired bureau chief of the Associated Press, who of course started his career in Vietnam as an intelligence officer and then, then became a journalist after that. And he writes, I've covered nearly 20 assorted conflicts from the Vietnam War to Afghanistan, wearing body armor on all my many embeds in Iraq and Afghanistan, not to mention the final push against the red shirts just down the street. That was in 2010. But not, not in most other places. The only time I was hit, a minor mortar shrapnel wound in Baghdad, Saad City, the flat jacket I wore didn't do much good. I was struck in the arm. But there, was no, there is no question that body armor has saved the lives of many colleagues. In Cambodia, where we didn't wear it, the AP stringers sustained numerous wounds, many of which would probably um, not have been inflicted or would have been mitigated by such protection. The same in other conflict zones, especially those of today's Iraq and Syria. Wearing body armor, especially the heavy earlier models, in places like Iraq, where temperatures rise to 40 degrees centigrade, while humping the man or humping the mountains of Afghanistan is a royal pain, but thank the Lord Buddha that they are now standard equipment for war correspondence. And then just one final, this, I've got tons of this, but I won't read it all. Uh, Jeremy Bowen, who you saw up there, this is a little bit more information than you probably want. It is vital for any journalist working in Mosul to have a full range of personal protection equipment, PPE, protective equipment, is it? I think it's technically called. When I was there recently, I had a flak jacket, ballistic combat helmet, gas mask and gas hood, and Kevlar underwear. I also carried a personal first aid kit, including military field dressings. It would be foolish and highly dangerous to try and work in Mosul without PPE. Now, I mean, the obvious benefit is that it protects you from wounding, but there's also another very practical thing, the, the, the medical support that well, is available. Support, but also that you're not taking away from much needed medical resources that are very hard to find there. You saw in our piece that little clinic was you know, very understaffed, uh, very poorly equipped. It was just a triage center basically. But you know, if you get wounded, you're a problem and, and they have to sort it out. And that's taking away much needed resources from other people. So that's a problem. But I, I just wanted to mention also that it's not just the plates in my jacket that have been problematic, it's the gas mask. And you know, there, is, there are lots of recorded instances of chemical weapons being used by the Islamic State in Mosul. Um, very basic ones, you know, nothing too sophisticated, but, but chlorine gas, stuff like that. And you know, a respirator will, will give you enough time to get out, um, but it's vital. And if you don't have it, you're, you're, you're in big trouble. I should just say as well, the, um, that sinkhole that Tony visited, um, a Kurdish journalist, a fantastically glamorous Kurdish journalist, Shifa Gardner, uh, we saw her the day before she died. She was on the front line with the Iraqi forces who were advancing, and even while they were advancing, they were stopping to take selfies with her. She was a great Kurdish journalist. But she went down there. She went down to that site because it's an important place to go because, you know, a war crime has been committed there. Mm. Um, and there was... It wasn't just the sinkhole that was there. They'd left behind, as you saw in Tony's piece, they'd left behind booby traps, and she was killed, and her cameraman was very badly injured. And, and thankfully, we knew that, and that was one of the reasons we didn't go any further. Um, so her sacrifice probably saved us a, a, a lot of problems. Yeah, I think there are a lot of like unexpected things um, in Iraq where you really can't do anything. I mean, if a sniper targets you and shoots you in the right position, then you're dead. But I mean, the, the minimal protection you can really get is the, the flag jackets and this mm. gas mask. And uh, I think what people also don't understand is that as journalists, you don't want to wear it. It's really heavy. It's 20 pounds. You're sweating, and it's not, it's not comfortable to move in it. And it's really, uh, but it's, it's absolutely essential. Mm. I mean, it's the minimum requirement to go anywhere close to what you saw, I think. Have, have any of you ever been hit? I was hit in Bosnia. I was shot in the Bangkok protests, but without vest, but luckily in the arm. But so what happened in Bosnia? 
Uh, we were at a cemetery in Sarajevo. There was a funeral. Uh, the funeral was um, it was a funeral of some kids who had been shot by snipers as they were trying to leave the city the day before. Um, there was a lot of press there covering the funeral. Uh, the cemetery was mortared, and uh, it was only later when I got back I realised that there was a big gash in the the rear ceramic plate of my jacket. And it's just a, a flesh wound. Well, it, it didn't hit me because I had a ceramic plate between me and. I see. So it it, yeah. it, it actually worked for you. Precisely. And if it hadn't been, uh, you hadn't been wearing that. Plate, well, who knows? But the gash was right in the middle where my spine was. Right. So. So I've Good. always We've travelled with it since. We have a, a microphone uh, in the middle of the room for <coughs> anybody who would like to ask a question. It's uh, quiet. Um, whilst people are racing to the microphone, um, <laughs> I might point out that, pl please get up there so that if I see you then I'll call you. Um, but I, I, it's worth taking a look at the casualties in Bangkok uh, in terms of journalists covering events. And since uh, 1974, there have been six journalists, Western journalists, killed. Uh, one was murdered and the circumstances of her killing, she worked for the Bangkok Post, have never been explained, so that's an anomaly. Uh, another one was killed up on the Burmese border in um, the late 80s, and he was actually blown up inside Burma but died in Thailand, but he did technically die here. And uh, the other four um, were all killed by Thai military activity. So you had Neil Davis and Bill Latch in 1985, they got themselves into the wrong place um, between a tank and a radio station that was being attacked by the tank. The tank fired wildly and they were both killed. Uh, there was heavy caliber machine gun and, and cannon fire. So what actually killed them is not clear. Neither of them were wearing any kind of protective equipment. These were veterans of the Cambodia, Vietnam War era. And uh, Neil Davis was killed on the spot and uh, Bill Latch was severely injured by shrapnel here um, and died uh, a couple of hours later. And then fast forward to uh, 2010, and we had a Japanese uh, correspondent here, Muramoto, Miyamoto, sorry, Muramoto, uh, who was flown in from Tokyo to cover demonstrations for Reuters. He landed with his camera. He wasn't wearing protective equipment. And quite clearly had no idea of what he'd got himself into. The, the footage of him, his last moments are quite horrifying because everything is going up. There are grenades flying, bullets going, and he's just standing there. And uh, anyway, he was killed. And then the um, last person was Fabio Palenghi, who was killed just along here uh, in the assault uh, in 2010 when Raja Prasong was taken, uh, taken back. And he was caught by a stray, stray bullet, which must have been fired by the military, judging by where it had come from. There were, t there were two military operations going on in Lumpini Park. Uh, and he died. I think he was dead on the spot, but he was, he was taken to hospital. He was wearing some sort of protective uh, equipment, but it was quite hopeless. I mean, he had... What was he wearing? You can tell me you were there. Uh, he wasn't wearing anything. He wasn't. He had a helmet. He had a crash helmet on, didn't he? Yeah, and we had another journalist who was shot at the bottom of Wireless Road, who was, you saying, dark clothes, sunglasses, he ran straight towards the military, carrying something mysterious in his hand, and they put three bullets in him. Not very surprisingly, actually. But anyway, question. Uh, and uh, I have two questions. Uh, uh, number one, when you guys come here to the airport, why don't you leave your equipment uh, <coughs> at the airport, and when you leave, uh, you, uh, you take it back for other countries? And uh, the, uh, by the way, I know Nick Nostic told me that he had a, a, a protection here, and he used it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Ob obviously, it's, uh, it's possible if you, uh, if you know the police or something. Uh, my, qu my question to uh, Mosul is, the civilians you saw there, or talked to, were these Arabs or Kurds? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, Mosul is a, a Kurdish town, mainly. Or, I mean, what people did you see there? 
Thanks in answer there. Uh, Mosul's mainly Arab. I mean, it's it, it's mainly Arab, but there there are there are Christian communities there. There, are, I think there are even some Yazidis there. There are Kurds there, but it's predominantly Arab. Um, as to the first question, it it is a, a huge problem, and it, w they, I have been told recently by um, various members of the the Thai government that really the solution is for me to, to turn up and declare this stuff. I, it's illegal. And what happens is if, if you declare it, you get stopped and it gets taken away. So we need it. We desperately need it. There is There needs to be a sensible solution. Uh, I, I mean, other organizations, major news organizations will now fly you to a, a third destination to pick it up and then move on. But that adds a thousand dollars to your trip. It's not easy. You know, particularly when something is happening just like that, you can't. Mm. Time. Yeah. yeah, time is of a, the essence. So it's quite a recent thing that they've started hauling you up for carrying it. For a mm. long time, we've been able to travel with it, and it's something that's new that they've stopped people and, and have started yeah. arresting people. So since you brought that up, uh, John Irvin, who was uh, ITN cameraman, Sean Swan, they were based in Bangkok in the early part of the century. Uh, 2000, 2003, and frequently travelled in and out of Don Wang Airport with body armour and a helmet in my carry-on luggage. I covered post-Gulf War Iraq as well as, Af as Afghanistan uh, and the Israeli Hezbollah War of 2006. I never had any problems. So this is something that's happened in the last, since 2010, basically. Uh, for decades, many news, org news organisations have valued Bangkok as a hub from which to travel far and wide. We have relied on the hospitality an understanding of the Thai authorities. Question? Uh, I'm Andrew Silver. In most of the clips, you were with the Iraqi uh, Special Forces or Rapid Reactionary, Re Rapid Reaction Force. Uh, but uh, I think there's also Iranian uh, units, and of course the Peshmerga. Uh, there's uh, mostly Sunni uh, elements and mostly uh, Shia elements that are engaged in the fight, but fighting separately against uh, Daesh. Uh, what, what can you say about the different, uh, have you been with some of these different groups, and what can you say about the differences uh, that would be of interest, whether their effectiveness as fighters or their treatment of civilians? So that's, that's the different uh, allied groups. Obviously, you haven't been with Daesh. Yeah. Well, for us, uh, it was very. There was a choice of three groups basically inside fighting inside Western Mosul at the moment. There are the federal police, the special forces, and the ERD, the Emergency Response Division, which are police, I think, yeah. but but specially trained elite police. elite police. So we we basically have a choice of going with those three groups. As you mentioned, there are uh, different issues about um, the, the, well, there there are Shia militia operating outside, but. But we were very much concentrating on the fight inside the city. And we made our decision about who to go with, um, principally to do with access, but also to do with safety. The federal police uh, are there in, probably in greater numbers than anyone else, but they are undisciplined. Uh, one day, we were walking out of the front lines. We decided that we had enough. The guys we were with pressed forward, so we had to make our way back, which was a little bit hairy. We got to a point where we knew we were safe, where, where the federal police were just relaxing, uh, cooking, uh, sleeping in some cases. And some guy just threw a grenade at me. They all had a good laugh. I laughed too, but uh, you know, it, 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 so it, you have to be a little bit careful about who you choose to go with. Yeah, the, uh, the federal police are hilarious. It's the, they really are the Keystone Cops. Uh, we were at the, I remember when we were just going into to West Mosul, there was a kid I mean, he was 15, 16 or something like that, 16, 17. And he had a plastic bag with him. This was in the plastic bag, and that was his improvised explosive devices for you know, taking out tanks or whatever. Um, they, 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 it's a very complex, uh, it's a very complex um, sectarian and ethnic mix in Iraq. Uh, Mosul is predominantly Arab. So the Peshmerga haven't entered the city. That would be that would cause problems if they did. They've been mainly to the north of the city. Uh, the PMUs, the Shia militia, um, also officially haven't entered the city. Though we do think they're sneaking in in police uniforms. Um, and we were with 
uh, the army haven't got involved in it. The army, for some reason, think they, they aren't equipped to do urban fighting. So they've let, that's why the casualty numbers are so high, they've let the ERD, which is the Police Rapid Response Unit, and the CTF, which are the elite, the special forces from the Ministry of Defence, they've let them do most of the fighting. It seems uh, that some of the ERD units may have uh, committed crimes against civilians, including rape, murder, robbery. Um, doesn't seem it was the unit I was with, it, but I think it was another unit. Um, and that's always the danger. You know, one of the reasons that Mosul welcomed the Islamic State, or large parts of Mosul welcomed the Islamic State, was because it distrusted the, the government in Baghdad. Um, it's a predominantly Sunni place. Um, the government is, certainly under Maliki, it had a strong Shia bent. And the worry is that when you have predominantly Shia forces, and it is Shias who are mostly dying in this battle, that they will they will enact revenge. Uh, we're only we're only beginning to get to the begin uh, the first idea of what crimes may have been committed. I will say though there was an expectation. I think it's fair to say that it was going to be much much mm. worse than this. They've kept a lid on it so far, by and large. Whether they make it to the end. And, and it's that point I went back to. The Islamic State look for gaps and they widen those gaps. So whether it's sectarian, whether it's ethnic, that's where the uh, that's the leverage points. And that will be the great tragedy of Mosul is and we saw that right at the beginning, Nick, didn't we? That the the battle was going very well, the fighting forces were going very well, but there was nothing behind them. There was no government, there was no food. Uh, and if they don't win it's that no Yeah. If, if they don't win that, then the circumstances will be ripe for IS or its successor to, to regain hold there. And I think that's the big question, is that when the, when the common enemy of IS has gone away, how do all these different groups get on? Or In Syria too. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, that's, that's what everybody's waiting to find out. Uh, just one quick thing to, to add, uh, because of the different groups that are fighting there. What hasn't been mentioned yet is also that the Americans are there, of course, but uh, they keep a pretty low profile and uh, mainly do airstrikes together with, I think, the special forces. I think, but uh, they are there in great numbers, actually, but they keep it quite low profile. Michael. Bradley, if you want to talk about 2010 here, please. Please do. Later, yeah. Um, just if I may, two uh, quick questions. One is that on the issue of organization and logistics, what about the economy of this? Um, it's, it might seem trivial, but in Iraq, there were what were called the unilaterals who would just sort of try and wade into the action. Have you ever come across anybody outside of a big organization who's trying to wade in? And the other thing is that, uh, this is I think more for you, Tony and, and Florian, Do you actually get insurance for when you go into these situations. And then Quentin, it, I was very interested in what you were saying about the difficulty getting editors to understand. I was back in Britain over Christmas and it struck me that the tone of reporting about Aleppo was radically different to what you're offering here. That it was much more, in a sense, emotional even on the BBC. You're talking about this being I forget the exact phrase you hear. I think the battle of our times or something like that. Do you think that the coverage that we're having in the rest of the media isn't up to the standards that you're setting here and that important issues like the geopolitical ones are being left out? I, I don't actually feel that about, about uh, you know, I, when I look at the coverage from Sky, uh, I mean, they've, they've committed to this story in an enormous way. Um, and at great personal risk, they've, I mean, Stuart Ramsey, who you heard from earlier, he, they, they were almost taken out by an IS suicide bomber who was driving a bulldozer, drove past them and then blew up and hit the uh, Iraqi forces. Um, ITV, have been, Channel 4 haven't been there, but ITV have been there. Um, American networks a little bit, CBS have been there. Uh, CNN's been quite. C CNN, CNN, of course, have done a, have done a great job there. 
So I think there's, I think, I mean, the difficulty with this is always to um, to sustain that. You know, there was a real, like, there was a, I think there was an expectation in Mosul that it would all be over by Christmas, as always, that shot fired. Um, and you know, it was just obvious from the get go, don't, uh, that it was going to. It was going to take a long time. I think one of the things that we've tried to do, the BBC's tried to do, is to somehow incorporate its Syria coverage with its Iraq coverage into what is essentially the same war or, or wars that are very closely related. Yeah. And that's probably, I don't know if that's what you mean by the bigger context, but that, that's something that's quite important because what happens in one place has a direct knock-on effect to what's going on in the other. I also think we have a responsibility, you know, when you saw that family in our first piece, uh, the, the mo I'm afraid I've forgotten her name, the, the mother who was pregnant, uh, she since had her baby, she had a wee boy um, in their bill. I mean, that was their first time outside of Mosul, and I think the thi the, we have a duty to remind our audiences that these aren't an alien species. These are husbands, mothers, fathers, sons, they're like us, and actually that we're not immune from their suffering, and not only are we not immune from their suffering, but we're not immune from the consequences of their war. But I think, I think you can still use the micro story like that to tell the bigger picture. I think that's something that we try to do. I mean, the, the thing with TV is you're always fighting against its duration sometimes. If you, get, if you get four minutes to tell a story, you're in a much better position to, to broaden out to that stuff than if you've got 2.30. To answer the, about the economics of the, the this, these issues, this it's very, very hard. Um, Florian and I are both freelancers. Um, so we do a lot of work <laughs> for Chinese TV, um, but other people as well. And every time you add an extra dollar onto the projection of the budget for a for a client, it gets more and more unlikely. The the insurance for these trips, thankfully, uh, there is a scheme organized through uh, Reporters Without Borders that is reasonable. Uh, I think it costs us about $1,500 every time we go and do this. But you can imagine that it's, you know, for a lot of news organizations, that is an awful lot of money. Added to the fact, uh, add to that the cost of an extra flight we're now going to have to make to pick up body armor and everything else, it, it's really hard. News gathering has changed enormously in the last couple of years. It, it's never been particularly easy, but, but there was always, uh, uh, the, uh, the, with a big company, there is an understanding that they have a duty of care. It's a legal obligation for a lot of people, including the BBC. But these days, for a lot of smaller organizations, that they just don't recognize that, particularly if you're hiring freelancers. Question. Yes, hi, my name's John Kane. I uh, have something to do with Chula Longcorn University. Uh, am I speaking correct? Oh, here, that's louder, I guess. Is that better? Uh, my question uh, is this. Um, this um, uh, Islamic um, um, organization, uh, ISIL or whatever we call it these days, um, has supporters of their own to be able to continue doing this and um, you know, the other Shia countries, uh, Iran, do they have people that uh, correspond to your function behind their lines, uh, hearing their side of the story and whatever, or uh, are all of the media around you when you're working? The Islamic State has very effective propaganda machines. Very sophisticated, um, absolutely. <laughs> with uh, the guy who, um, whose hand had been amputated or cut off, um, who was in our last piece, we were actually looking through uh, some of their videos, and there is an amazing amount of stuff on YouTube, as there are as there is on other social media platforms, um, because it had been very well documented and uh, and put up a video, um, edited. And you find that with a lot of this stuff. It's, it's all there. So they, they are acutely aware of, of their image. They manipulate it. They, they project it. And there are people who are watching it. Obviously, we can't get in there. It would be far too dangerous. Um, I, I mean, when we were out, there are a lot of media trying to get out onto the front lines t to do the story. You are acutely aware of the fact that you're only seeing one side of the story, but 
frankly, the other side is, is impossible to get. So, so we, we do what we can to balance it out, but uh, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Also, you. you know, there's, uh, while, while we have very strict rules on the impartiality, there's some things which are just wrong, and you don't have to balance out the Islamic State because they're a murderous death cult. But what you do have to do is you have to explain to the audiences why they have support. Um, no one's going to be embedding with the Islamic State because, or indeed with uh, Nusra Front, Al Qaeda in Syria, because they murder and kidnap journalists. Are, are there any uh, Middle Eastern journalists that have been able to get in? There, uh, I heard of one German journalist who was yeah. embedded in Syria we, for yeah. I think about a week, hmm. <coughs> and he wrote a book about it. But we've uh, met him on. on on our trip into Mosul. Uh, what was he called, Dr. Jürgen Totenhofer yeah. or something like that. Um, who was a curious man. We, we shared a, a ride into Mosul with him, uh, which I was quite keen not to go in with him because uh, I, I think he may have attracted quite a lot of negative attention. Um, but he, uh, he has been into Raqqa. He made a television program about it. He, he wrote a book. Frankly, it felt to me like he was he was a self-publicist. I did from what I had seen of his material, I didn't learn anything more that I hadn't already seen about the Islamic State or Raqqa. So, so there are people who are willing to. Uh, but he he went himself and he took his son as his cameraman, which again I cannot imagine what it's like to take your own child into a situation like that. Mm. Uh, George McLeod, just a. I mean, the, the coverage of, of Iraq seems, seems very good, but um, when I look at how this is being covered in Syria, um, you know, you have stories of Al-Qaeda controlling large parts of the country. Uh, Yemen, there was footage coming out of, of uh, UAE and Saudi troops fighting side by side with Al-Qaeda. Um, do you have any views on why the coverage of, of you know, Syria and Yemen is a little bit more circumspect with, with regard to you know Islamic extremist groups extremist groups such as Al Qaeda compared to Iraq. On Syria, uh, on Syria, we've the BBC has invested a lot of time, money, and uh, uh, my colleagues um, Ian Parnell and Paul Wood have put themselves in grave personal danger to report the untellable story there, the almost untellable story. In fact, Paul uh, Paul Wood, Fred Scott and Kev Sweeney, their uh, security guy, and, Ga and Gassan, their uh, producer, were all kidnapped for a while covering that story. It's really hard. It's very, very difficult. We want to go there. They don't want us there. Nusra don't want us there for, uh, they, have, they have their reasons for that. The, the risk from the Islam, I mean, I've gone in a few times to Syria when we've been very close to the Islamic State, and the going price for a foreigner at the moment I mean, Britain doesn't pay, but everybody else does, is somewhere between 12 and $16 million. So you have to tread very carefully <laughs> under yeah, those I circumstances. We, uh, we, the way the BBC works is that we, we've got different teams that do either the opposition side or the government side. So I'm part of the group that goes in and gets visas and goes into Damascus or Homs or Aleppo or wherever we can get to on a government visa. But equally, we will try and get teams across to the other side. The only thing that we, c we can do if we can't go in ourselves is have a network of proxies. But unless you're there seeing it yourself, there's always a limit to what you can do with that material. And I will say about Yemen, uh, we've had BBC Arabic correspondents, Fergal Keane's been in, Orla's been in. Uh, we've, go we've gone consistently. It's a harder sell though. The world, I mean, it's, a, it's undoubtedly, I think it's a, a harder sell for the audience and for perhaps for editors, though I would say the 10 o'clock news has committed a lot to telling that story. It's very, very difficult to get in. Yeah, access uh, is the problem. Access is a real problem. You can fly now, to Herbal quite easily. You, you can't even, um, journalists were allowed in on UN flights and they've stopped that now. And how long does that boat ride take? 50 hours, I think. 50 hours, and that's through very dangerous waters. So. All of that makes it more complicated. You know, it's funny because you almost get nostalgic for wars where that were run by the Americans, where you could just jump on a Black Hawk and they'd take you wherever you wanted to go, and you'd turn up and there'd be a defect with, you know, steak and things like that. Um, 
those days seem, seem to be, you know, they don't fight those wars anymore. Maybe they will under uh, President Trump. They don't seem to fight those wars anymore. Um, but access, access, is, access really is the killer. I mean, we've just spent, you know, the amount of time we've been, try, we've been trying to get, I shouldn't get into the details, but the amount of time we've been trying to get into Raqqa before it happens, and it's just proving impossible at the moment. Bradley, do you want to talk? Um, uh, what, what, I'm Bradley Cox, but where do you want me to focus? No, on? just, uh, I mean, go back to what happened uh, in Thailand in 2010. You were covering that uh, very actively. Well, on May 19th, uh, the army was um, coming up uh, this road here to Ratchapasong. Rach this is the day where the, the whole thing finally... Uh, fell apart and Florian was down near uh, Lumpini Park, right? Yeah. Where, where uh, you had a lot of stuff with the tanks coming in and mm, yeah. demolishing stuff. And uh, I was over here by Saracen, uh, which was like a cross street just down here, maybe a kilometer. And um, it was based, that, that was a line where the red shirts were and the army was coming up and hiding in all the tents and stuff. There was a lot of freelancers there. Uh, virtually nobody had any body armor at all. In fact, the only people I saw who had any body armor were the uh, big agencies. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in fact, later in the day, I, I saw Alistair from BBC. He was going, coming back here, and the stage had fallen. It, it had, uh, Raj Brisson had been vacated. But I saw him wearing all this, all this gear, and me and a French photographer <laughs> you know, hung in right behind him because that was like the only protection we had getting, getting out of it. <laughs> so, it worked. But um, when we were down at Saracen, though, um, you know, the, the, I guess it was like their front line, but all it was was a couple of tires and uh, a piece of wood going across. And bullets were sort of flying from all over. Um, I had a bullet fly off this tire that was only two feet in front of me, and, um, and when uh, uh, Fabio got hit, um, ironically, we were actually going away from the army. We were, we were coming back up the street because we heard some sort of disturbance. We were uh, running over there to see what it was, and uh, I, I felt something in my leg, and I realized that I had been you know, nicked by a, a bullet going by, and I turned around, I saw Fabio down the ground. And um, I don't know if he died uh, uh, immediately, but he, he, he was certainly dead within like two minutes. And um, the one thing, uh, the red shirts that, that they had um, set up pretty well is that anyone who was injured, um, they scooped them up right away and they put them on a motorcycle and they brought them uh, down to uh, Ratchaper Song and to the uh, hospital right Lisa. here. So um, unfortunately, there was like you know ten journalists you know trying to pick pick up Fabio and drag him, uh, not drag him but pick him up, and he, they kept dropping him and then picking him up again. And then to get him on this motorcycle was about fifty meters away. And uh, but but by the time he showed up at the uh, hospital, uh, he was dead. But I also saw a lot of guys taking really in crazy, risky uh, moves. I mean, anyone who was up near the front, I mean, was being a bit of an idiot anyway because we had no protection at all. Um, but then I saw guys running into where all the tents were, where the, where the army guys were, and just running through there with, with cameras and stuff, and um, just super, super dangerous mm -hmm. and, and kind of stupid. Um, as well, but uh, uh, the other thing I would say about Ratchaper's song is um, um, I got fixed up at this hospital as well, and um, I went out to the stage. No, I, actually, I was trying. I was going back this way, and there were some huge bombs that went off, and so everybody was running back towards Ratchaper's song, and uh, and 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 I went up on the stage. And this is when they were actually telling, you know, that, that stage had been going nonstop for what, uh, six weeks, two months, something like this. 
And this was a moment where they were telling everybody, get out of here, leave, it's over. And the crowd was, the crowd was just like screaming back at the leaders on the stage, no, you guys go, you protect yourselves right now. And uh, at one point I, I panned because there was, there was some fire um, uh, near the back of the audience. And I, I just wanted to see what it was. I panned over there and I panned back and all the guys on the stage were suddenly gone. I mean, in like <laughs> seven seconds, you know, I was filming them and then over here I come back and they're gone. And, uh, and um, but that was, that was like, you know, a crazy, a crazy hour and, th and that's when everyone was just sort of going wherever they could go and, and the leaders were sort of, you know, some were hidden in cars and, and everyone was just running every which way. I mean, it was, it was, it was crazy. And when you thought that it was finally gonna be over and it calmed down, you know, then, all this stuff happened in the Watt, where, where these sharpshooters were just cutting down um, uh, people uh, in the Watt, including a nurse, you know, wearing a big Red Cross sign. I mean, I think they killed six, six people, mm -hmm. you know, wounded a bunch of others, including some journalists as well. Um, so it was uh, yeah. a crazy time. And, and not, no body armor, basically, anywhere, except for the the uh, Thai army, yeah. Right, well anyway, but it would, the point was that the freelancers were noticeably chaotic, yeah. completely unequipped, and yeah. basically didn't know what they were doing. It was, we were lucky a lot more weren't hurt, but we're not talking about that group, we're talking about people who are professionally set up, yeah. um, and organized I'm and structured. I'm not sure that you can make that distinction these days. Um, yeah. You know, well, so a easily lot of anyway, this, yeah. Well, yeah, a lot of these conflicts, I mean, even Mosul to a certain extent, there are, uh, you know, there are a core of people in our bill, some of whom who have a lot of training, others who have virtually none, uh, who are trying to get into the business, who know that the way yeah. to do it is to get out onto the front line. You know, they're doing the best that they can, the best that they know how, but I've done three, four hostile environment courses where we're trained in, in first aid, in how to avoid a lot of these situations or how to mitigate the danger. I'm sure you guys have to refresh, what, every two years? Every three years. Um, that's a course that costs... 1,500 pounds. Right. The UK, it's 1,500 pounds. 1,500 pounds. Uh, it's very expensive. Um, to get this level of training, it, it, is, it really costs a lot. And most, most news organizations just won't pay for it, sadly. The BBC won't let people, they, uh, obviously um, there's an exception for local staff, uh, although if they become quite permanent they get them on a course pretty quickly, but you have to have done this course in order to yeah. work for the BBC. I mean it, it's worth making the point that the four of us fly in and out, there are guys who are going to work every day in Mosul who, yeah. um, you know. I, I just wanted to add like uh, in our bill, like the where you fly into Iraq from, from here, basically. Uh, there's tons of freelancers that, I mean, mostly photographers that go in and out of Mosul. They're sharing taxis together because like, it, you know, going in with a car is about 300 or $400 probably. Mm. Uh, so you need the ride to get in, to get out. They don't have any safety gear or most of them don't have safety gear. They don't have the environmental, uh, the, the hostile environment training. Uh, so they really go in f to get that one or two photos that they can publish and I'm not sure how much they make with it, but yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's really, it's really tight for free. So they don't even get day rates, they're just going in to shoot pictures. Yeah. It's really desperate stuff. Um, you know, the, the organizations are much more careful than people realize, and they always have been. For example, 1988 in Burma, when it went pop, none of the, ma the major services would allow any journalists to go into the country. It was only freelancers that went in and operated, and maybe a very small number of journalists on assignment to um, newspapers. And last week, Jonathan was going down to BBC to Mindanao, and I think he lost three days whilst the BBC decided if it was safe enough for him to go. I mean, it was sort of not quite that crude, but no, making but we sure. That crude. <laughs> well, but making sure that they had it figured before before they let him go down there. And uh, you know, in, in um, Malawi, um, the Philippines bombed eleven of their own people. So it's a pretty wild environment. 
Um, if there are any more questions, I'm going to read you one final thing uh, from Alex Crawford, who's a special correspondent for Sky News. And he says, having fairly recently returned from Mosul, m where my crew and I somehow survived three suicide bombs within an hour and a half, I cannot imagine being able to cover and report on this extremely dangerous and unpredictable conflict without body armor. It is the basic requirement in order to operate as a journalist today in Mosul. There are suicide bombers and snipers attacking the troops and the journalists who are trying to report the, from there uh, on an hourly basis. The body armor could be the one item which saves his life, and that and just sheer good fortune. A fellow, fellow journalist, as fellow journalists who have been traveling to Mosul on a regular basis and seen both the increased risks as well as the absolute necessity in reporting the ongoing developments in this complicated conflict, we respectfully urge the Thai authorities to be compassionate and reasonable in their dealings with Tony Cheng, who was simply carrying potentially life-saving equipment in order to, his, to do his job, which is the position, obviously, that we completely endorse. And uh, in the past, the FCC has offered to try and find a way through this. I think it's extremely unrealistic to imagine that the law will be changed, but the implementation of the law can be changed. There can be licenses, uh, waivers. There are ways around this. And I, I think, actually, good reason will, will prevail at the end of the day, because there are people on the Thai side who uh, are fed up with this sort of problem popping up the whole time, including the police who have to enforce the laws. They don't make the law, they enforce it. And sometimes people are lucky like Florian, sometimes people are unlucky like Tony, and we don't know what the difference was. Um, but anyway, I think reason will prevail and we, we will certainly keep trying to do it. So on that, thank you very much, Florian, Quentin, our unexpected guest, Nick and Tony, and uh, have another beer. <laughs>